Christ from beginning to end. We're moving into a new sheet, and the sheet is um, continues topic two. The story and our letter is letter F, and we're looking at Moses. So uh, hopefully you have a little half page outline. Um, I think I I might have passed those out actually two weeks ago, or had one of the deacons or elders pass it out two weeks ago, and then because I really was ambitious, thinking that we'd get we'd get through the previous uh, section two weeks ago, and then. Uh, you know, it took us took us a whole other week and a half to uh, to finish, uh, which is fine because it's all a it's all good discussion. Anytime you're talking about Abraham and the gospel promise uh, to him, it it really does you know, it really opens up a lot of other things. But um, but if you don't have if you don't have one of those uh, half page outlines, I have some up here and um, at least a few. Yeah, there's probably about 10 here if anybody, uh, if anybody needs one. But uh, here you go, Paul. Thank you. Um, like I said, those should have been, I'm pretty sure they were passed out last week so, uh, uh, or the week before. So um, should be okay. Uh, at, least, uh, at least several of us should already have, should already have one. Um, <clears throat> but this one is, a, is probably going to take us a while to get through. Um, looking at Moses because there's so much that happens here. Um, so I want to start off just by reading the uh, passage that's listed there at the top, uh, Exodus 19, and we'll read verses 4 to 6. And I'll read it, and then I'm going to uh, pray. Oh, Paul, are there more? Are there more back there? Yeah. Oh, very good, very good. So we have more. Excellent. All right. Yeah, very good. Um, but yeah, Exodus 19. Uh, four to six is what we'll look at. Thank you. Um, Paul Manzo, deacon extraordinaire. So Exodus 19, verses uh, four to six, and I'll read it, and then, uh, then we'll pray and we'll talk about it. Let's go to the Lord. Or actually, let's listen to the Lord first, and then, let's, uh, then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. He says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Now we can go to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for another Lord's Day. We thank you for the blessing and means of grace uh, that is the local church gathering. Um, an embassy of heaven, as it were, and uh, you meet with us by your spirit. Indeed, we pray that you would. And uh, we pray uh, just that you would guide and shepherd us through these brief moments that we spend uh, gathering around your word, listening to it, considering these things, and, um, and uh, being uh, led uh, in this time by, uh, by a, a feeble and merely human under-shepherd, um, acknowledging each and every one of us that the chief shepherd, the Lord Jesus, uh, is our only hope and the one who truly leads us. And so I pray, O oh Lord, that you would, and I just pray that you would lead our thinking and uh, help us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds uh, as we uh, consider uh, your word and, see, and to see Christ therein and to understand our redemption even better so that we can live lives of godliness and peace and joy. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So, um, <clears throat> looking down, you see there in those verses that we read, verses 4 to 6, the emphasis is on how uh, God uh, took Israel and brought them out of Egypt, the land of slavery, and made them his people. Um, this, is, uh, this is after they have uh, you know, passed through the sea and after they've gone into the wilderness They've gone to the mountain. They're about to get the, uh, the Lord's uh, law, the Ten Commandments, and everything that follows, all of that. And, um, and here, just, here we see God's purpose in all of this, uh, or at least his immediate purpose. Um, it's not just that he wants to overcome the powerful of the world, i.e. Uh, Egypt, you know, like you hear from a lot of uh, uh, liberation theology folks. But, uh, but here, the purpose, the purpose in all of this is that he wants them to be his treasured possession there in verse 5. I want you, 
uh, Israel to be my treasured possession among all the peoples. Interesting, he says, for all the earth is mine. So the whole earth is mine, everything belongs to me, but you are my treasured possession. You are uh, my, f- my favorite, as it were. And uh, I mean, I say as it were, and that's probably inappropriate. He actually does, he favors them, and he, uh, he sees them as his very people, and, um, and indeed treats them as such. So to be my treasured possession, they're therefore called to be a kingdom of priests, called to be a holy nation, uh, all of those things. And this is, um, I don't want to get ahead of myself too, uh, too quickly where we're uh, looking back too early, um, but everything throughout Genesis, um, you know, really anticipates uh, what's happening here where that small family, you know, where you have Abraham as an old man and Sarah as an old woman and they have, you know, the one son, Isaac, after Ishmael uh, is, uh, is born to uh, Abraham and Hagar and all of that. They have one son, Isaac, and then he has two sons and um, Jacob and Esau. And then, of course, Jacob has I mean, Esau hunts Jacob, and it seems like, you know, at every turn of the story, things could go south quickly and the family line could die. Uh, but God protects it and keeps it, and even through human sin throughout Genesis, he brings about this incredible thing where Jacob ends up having, uh, you know, a million sons, essentially. And, um, and eventually they end up in power. Uh, Joseph ends up uh, in power in Egypt, and they all end up going there and, and blessing the nations. But uh, here, uh, here it's they've become an, a nation themselves, and um, they're God's treasured possession, called to be a kingdom of priests. And they would know very clearly what a priest is supposed to do. A priest, uh, whether whether a godly priest like Melchizedek in Abraham's day, um, or just a priest of one of the pagan cult religions, a priest is one who goes between the people and God. A priest is one who mediates. That's what they do. And he said, he's saying, you're going to be a kingdom of priests there in verse 6 in a holy nation. You're supposed to go between me and uh, the world, representing me to the world and representing them to me as well. Pray for them. Pray on their behalf, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the whole goal here is for them to be his people and them to be a kingdom of priests. Now, I want to look here, if you look at number one there, I want to look at the two deliverances uh, that happen by sea. And uh, maybe I should have, uh, if I would have thought about it, I would have put deliverance in the sea because delivery in the sea sounds like, um, you know, sounds like uh, some, some mail service or something that's out on the water. But um, he does, there are two deliverances in the sea uh, in the book of Exodus, uh, primarily two of them. There's one that happens early in Exodus, and this is in Exodus 2, and it's when Moses is delivered in the Nile. And then later on, it's when Israel is delivered in Exodus 14 uh, in the Red Sea. And so um, these two deliverances that are absolutely essential uh, to the book of Exodus and to understanding the story. Uh, You know well, probably, that in Exodus 1, uh, after the Israelites have increased and they've become a a huge people group in Egypt, uh, pharaohs rise, uh, rise up hundreds of years after Joseph. Uh, ruled who forget about Joseph's blessing uh, on Egypt and how much the Israelites were important uh, to Egypt. Pharaohs rise up that forget about all of that, and they become uh, anti-Semitic pretty pretty clearly and uh, mistreating the Israelites and treating them like slaves and trying to kill uh, the firstborn sons. Um, and you know the story in Exodus 1, how the uh, midwives don't listen to the Pharaoh when he says to kill all the firstborn sons. They say um, they they. You know, they tell him that they're going to, but then, but then uh, they don't do it, and then they go back and tell him the reason is because uh, those Jewish women are vigorous, and uh, and uh, we we can't do it because they're too strong, and um, this is how God protects the people, and um, and uh, because the midwives fear God, He gave them families, and so Pharaoh just at the end of chapter one commands all his people, every son that's born to the Hebrews, cast him into the Nile, but let every daughter live. Um, Really just a, a horrible, horrible decree, isn't it? Uh, cast every firstborn boy into the Nile. I just can't, I, I just can't imagine, you know, hearing that kind of decree. And I have a hard time believing that every, every Egyptian would have been on board with such a thing. Um, but um, I also have a hard time believing that 
that uh, there wouldn't be any Egyptians who would be on board with Pharaoh. They're, they're trying to control the population uh, of the Israelites. And so the very next thing, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, hid him three months. And when she could hide him no longer, and I, I couldn't help, but uh, in the first part of verse 3, when she could hide him no longer, I couldn't help but just... Think about how as Haddon has gotten a little bit older uh, and he just had his first birthday this past week, his cry has gotten that much more ferocious and that much louder. And, um, and uh, just, I'm wondering if that's what's being implied here by when she could hide him no longer. It's not like, uh, it's not like, uh, like Clifford the big red dog where he gets so big that eventually the family has to move out to the... Uh, they have to leave the city and move out to the country where there's more space for their giant dog. I don't think Moses is a giant here, but it's a, eventually it becomes pretty clear that there is a crying child in that house. And uh, um, I, I don't know, I'll, it could just be because I know the difference between my kids, but the two boys cry different than the girl did. And uh, <laughs> Maybe people could tell that that was a boy. So she takes him and she puts him in a basket, verse 3, of bulrushes, uh, papyrus reeds, <clears throat> and uh, dabbed it with bitumen and pitch, puts the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river and saw the basket among the reeds, and that uh, she takes him and she's going to raise him. Um, I just want to say that whereas Pharaoh had decreed at the end of chapter 1, cast every firstborn Hebrew into the Nile, um, Moses indeed was cast into the Nile. It's just that he was cast into the Nile in a basket that's an awful lot like the ark earlier in Genesis. It's dabbed with bitumen, and it's exactly the same thing as uh, earlier in Genesis with, uh, with Noah's ark. And um, just, again, a theme that's repeating Again, I'm getting ahead of myself here with looking back, but uh, because of this, Moses is going to be uh, picked up by Pharaoh's daughter and raised um, as royalty. And, uh, and so he's saved there uh, in the Nile. Um, it's a misnomer. It says delivery in the sea, and then it says Nile. It's just a river, obviously. Um, apparently, I'm in denial about whether, whether denial is a is a river or a sea. Sorry. No, I'm not. I think, uh, I think it was worth it. And uh, you're welcome. But uh, <clears throat> then, later, uh, then later the story of um, Israel being delivered in the Red Sea in chapter uh, 14. And uh, you could turn there, but you don't have to. I'm just going to say a couple of comments here <clears throat> before we talk about uh, God's judgment there uh, in all of these things. Um, but after all of the uh, after all the plagues and after, after everything that happens there in chapter 14, verse 4, God says that he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he'll pursue Israel and get glory over Pharaoh and his host. And in verse 8, it says that the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the prophet, or while the people of Israel, excuse me, were going out defiantly. <coughs> excuse me. And um, verse 10 when Pharaoh drew near and the people of Israel lifted their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching with them or after them, they feared greatly and the people of Israel cried out to the Lord and said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? And I, I wrote in my margin here, first grumble. It's the first time, I, I believe it's the first time that Israel grumbles uh, against uh, Moses as a people uh, there in, uh, in the Exodus. And uh, Moses says here in verse 13, Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he'll work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. <clears throat> the Lord will fight for you. <coughs> Excuse me, something's making me cough today. And uh, you have only to be silent. Notice how confident Moses is towards them. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. But then look in verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Um, reading between the lines, it seems to me like Moses is pretty confident towards Israel, but then when he's in private and he's calling out to the Lord, he's pleading with him, 
please deliver us, please deliver us, O oh Lord, uh, such is a picture of spiritual leadership. Um, uh, confidence, uh, hopefully, by God's grace when you're leading, uh, but also in the prayer closet, uh, acknowledging to the Lord, this is only your doing, Lord. This is, if you don't do it, it's not going to happen. If you don't build the house, those who build it labor in vain. And so eventually, <clears throat> you know what happens. He uh, draws the water up, drives the sea back, and all the people of Israel go in the midst on dry ground. Uh, there in verses 21 following. Um, and uh, verse 28, the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. And so eventually, the goal there in verse 31 is laid out. They saw the great power of the Lord, Israel did. And so they feared him and they believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. And so what we see here, we see uh, in these deliveries, we see God's judgments. So he judges at three levels. First, uh, he judges, you can put it down there, judges Egypt, Sin, and Pharaoh. So throughout this whole thing, he judges Egypt, he judges Sin, and then he judges Pharaoh. And in particular, what I'm talking about with Egypt is in the plagues. So um, we skipped over the plagues, but that's just because we don't have time to look at, look at everything. And the plagues are verses se uh, chapter 7 to 10. And then he judges sin. <clears throat> judges sin in the killing of the firstborn of the Egyptians. And before we accuse God of any wrongdoing, which skeptics and critics often do, a couple of things should be remembered. The first thing is that God gives life, which means God can take life. The reason why murder is wrong when I, if I were to take life is because I don't give life. That's why it's wrong. I don't have a right to do that. God gives life. Part of what it means to be God is to take life if he wants to. And because life is a gift, it's just for him to end it if he chooses to. That's the first thing to remember. The second thing to remember is that, well, Pharaoh and all of Egypt with him, even if not every single person was on board with this, they, want, they started to kill the firstborn of Israel first. You could argue they started it. And uh, so here, God is going to judge um, Egypt with the exact same thing that, uh, that they were trying to do to his people. And furthermore, so he judges their sin, but then he judges Pharaoh in the sea. And uh, that's what we just saw in uh, chapter 14. And so what he does... <clears throat> You could say that all of these things are a reverse of what uh, uh, are a reverse of what had been done to the Israelites earlier. Um, Pharaoh had made work and life like a plague for Israel. Nonstop working, 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 working. It's terrible, and so he gives them plagues. Pharaoh had wanted to kill the firstborn of, of the Israelites, and it seems like he succeeded to some degree, so God responds by taking the lives of the firstborn of the Egyptians. Um, and, then, and then Pharaoh wants to, in killing the firstborn of the Israelites, have them thrown into the, to the Nile, kill them with the water. And so what does God do in response? He kills Pharaoh in water. Um, and, not, and not only does this look back to Genesis with the flood, but it also, again, just demonstrates that if you mess with God and you mess with God's people, uh, he who is incredibly, incredibly long-suffering and patient will be long-suffering and patient, but not for forever. Um, and he's going to respond with judgment uh, in time. So, 
Uh, there's a book by uh, Jim Hamilton, who's a professor at Southern Seminary. It's a biblical theology book uh, that's where he sees the Bible's central theme uh, as God's glory in salvation through judgment. And um, that's the title of the book. And uh, my thought is, well, that doesn't really, it's not really a, a title that sells, I wouldn't think. But, um, but uh, I, even if I would kind of give the Bible maybe like a different, uh, maybe I would construe like the thematic center of Scripture a little differently, I don't disagree with him that primarily the message of Scripture is that God is glorified through sal- uh, God is glorified in salvation through judgment. We see it right here. He saves the people of Israel as he judges the people of Egypt. Um, Similarly, at the cross, um, he saves us by Jesus taking uh, our judgment on himself. Um, And ultimately, the cross, whereas they think that they are um, killing this, this, uh, this religious zealot, Actually, they're being judged themselves at the cross, and God is working salvation for us. His glory in salvation through judgment. We see, we see a really a picture of it right here. So any, any thoughts uh, on, uh, on these things before we move on? Jeff? Can you check me on the correlation that I've found between the response that I'm imagining? So if there's a judgment against Israel, then there's going to be a I mean, um, it's not popular. It sounds, uh, it, it sounds mean, and it sounds like we're celebrating death. We're not. Um, we're celebrating life. The, like death exists in rebellion against God, and. Um, I look forward to the day when that's going to be gone, totally. And if that means that those who didn't repent and those who never came to faith aren't a part of it, I rejoice in that. Um, While at the same time giving God glory for for giving me repentance and rejoicing that if not for God's grace, there go I. Um, So to your point, Jeff, I, I think you're absolutely right. There's, you know... They grieve, they grieve early in, uh, in Exodus here, but then in chapter 15, what do they start to do? They begin to sing. You know, after they're delivered, I'll sing to the Lord for each triumph gloriously, the horse and rider he's thrown into the sea. Um, it's similar to, to Psalm 136. He overthrew Pharaoh and all his host for his steadfast love endures forever. Well, that doesn't sound very loving to to take somebody's life. Well, but they wanted to take the life of his people, and they hated him. So, again, God's very long-suffering. He's long-suffering towards Pharaoh, long-suffering towards the people of Egypt. This is 400 years that went on, and uh, very patient on God's part. Um, But he'll by no means clear uh, clear the... He'll by no means clear the guilty. And, uh, And so he carries out a sentence, and so they, they rejoice because he threw them into the sea. The Lord is a man of war, verse 3. The Lord is his name. Um, the floods covered them, verse 5. Verse 6, your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Just on and on, verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? 
you have to keep in mind, a lot of these people, they're used to uh, polytheism. Uh, and it's, and polytheism falls hard. You can see it just by following the Old Testament narrative. Even after they are taken into their land, um, with great kings and great building up of the kingdom and all of that, nevertheless, the polytheism is sticking to them. Like they still, they still have these high places and all of that. And here, at least they're saying, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Nobody's like him is the point. So um, <clears throat> I just think that you're right. I think that um, here we have a, here we have a, a type of the rejoicing that is going to take place in the end when sin and all of its effects are no more. Um, would, again, I, I saw your hand a second ago, Peter. I know you're, I'll, I'll, I'll get to you when you get to you when you get back. But um, in, uh, in Revelation, <clears throat> I want to say it's in chapter 15, I think. Yeah, 15. Actually, it's 15, 16, it's, uh, it's 18, it's 19. We could just really go on and on here. Uh, and it doesn't just start in 15, I don't think. Uh, there's one point where it actually refers to the song that gets sung to God uh, as the uh, song of Moses. Um, but in chapter 15 of Revelation, verse 3, that's called the song of Moses. And the, and the song of the Lamb. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord, God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? You alone are holy. Um, next chapter, 16, 5. Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was for you. Listen to this. For, who, for you brought these judgments. They have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It's what they deserve. Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. But that that sets up actually really well the um, the last kind of like application section of my message this morning because I'm going to be talking a little bit about how um, not just forgiveness but why it is that not letting God be the judge keeps us and hinders us from serving the way that Christ wants us to because we expect things in response we expect th- we expect earthly rewards for these things. And, um, and I just think there's, a, I think there's a connection. But that's really well said, uh, Jeff. Just, you just see it there. And then in Revelation 18, <laughs> fallen, fallen as Babylon the great. She's become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. Um, they just rejoice, fallen as Babylon the great. Chapter 19, verse 1. Hallelujah, salvation, glory, power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and judge, uh, just, and he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Boy, Pastor, when you read Revelation like that, you sound like a, an old you know, New England Puritan or something like that. It's like, well, um, if, if, you're not, um, if you're not happy that God's justice is going to win in the end and that his enemies are going to be judged, his enemies being those who will not repent and will not come to him and turn and acknowledge him, if it doesn't make you rejoice that he is going to have his will, which is perfect and just, um, you might have to question whether you're actually going to go to heaven because only those in heaven are those who want to be there where God's perfect will wins. And his perfect will is not just, it's not just universalism. It's not just everybody gets saved. Everybody can, everybody can turn and repent, but at the end of the day, 
Do this is hard. It's hard. But the Lord has enemies. And we don't battle against flesh and blood, but we battle against spiritual forces. It's just that some people who are people who are flesh and blood have been taken captive by the spiritual forces. So our work is to expose the spiritual ideologies and forces and all of that in hopes that uh, people will uh, escape the snare of the devil. Uh, so Bob and then Mike and then Peter. Absolutely. No. Yeah. Well, isn't it the case, Bob, that, uh, so for those who couldn't hear on the microphone, um, uh, Bob just mentioned that it's, a, it's essentially, it's essentially a, an ancient Egyptian abortion practice, uh, in, infanticide, which is what it is today too. Isn't it the case that in, uh, uh, in China for a time, at least, I don't know if they still do it. The boys were being, were being killed so that they could con- so that they could control the population, um, the girls. Oh, oh, all right. Nine, what nineteen to one ratio? What? Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. That that many girls to that many girls to boys. You said nineteen girls to two boys. Or to one to one boy. Well, some boys would consider that to be the jackpot. But uh, sorry, that's I mean, like if it was if it was that many. But uh, um, that's I mean, it's horrendous. I mean, that's how a, a communist, uh, you know, a, a, a totally just corrupt society would work. But are we that much better over here with our practices too? Yeah, it's uh, it's the same, and um, the most helpless. People in society, the most helpless people, are the are those little ones, and um, it's really it's it's a little stomach turning to to read about this and even hear these kind of like numbers and statistics and all that. But it should be it should be stomach turning, shouldn't it? Mike, what are you going to say? War, okay, okay. Um, whether it be American Civil War, Revolutionary War, Vietnam War, of course, Ukraine mm-hmm. conflict was one time was considered a war or not. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about that too. And it also makes me think of many strong Christian men and women and allies who fight in these wars and need to fight, need to kill for their country, some of which are veterans in this room who I admire mm-hmm. for their service. Mm-hmm. So the question is, the question is, where's the line? What makes, what makes um, murder, the question, simple, simpler, is there such a thing as just war? Uh, let me just say this. There's a difference between between killing and murdering. Um, in Ecclesiastes three, there is a time to kill, um, and um, you know, most most I would say this: just war is war that that is trying to protect life. Um, and uh, 
unjust war is a war that is just trying to build my or our kingdom, even if it means taking life. Uh, just wars are wars that are willing to endure the, uh, the atrocity, not the atrocity, but the, the, the pain of taking hopefully less life for the sake of protecting more. Now, we don't have, I don't have the right to decide those kind of things. Um, but I also have a duty, <clears throat> I do have a duty uh, to, the, to my citizenship wherever God's placed me. And um, if I were called into service, I would want to try to avoid this at all, you know, avoid this as, as much as I could. Um, but also, that doesn't equal that. Murder is when, uh, is when I decide um, on my own that it's time to take somebody else's life. Or, frankly, that it's time to take my own life. Um, that's murder. Uh, killing is, is different. And I just think that we see this uh, in the fact that all throughout the Old Testament, you've got God's people in wars, and they kill, and so often it's God who gives it, who gives them the victory. Um, and yet he also says, you shall not murder. So it's like, it, it must be the case that they're not the same thing. So that, that's, how, that's how I would answer it. But it's a, it's a good question. You know, it's a good question. You see the movie... Um, did we go see this at, at Hacksaw Ridge or was that Kate and I that went? I know it was the same theater in Hackettstown, I think, that we went to see that Louis, uh, what was that movie, Paul, that we went to? You know, about the, the guy who was the, um, the runner who was in World War II, Louis Zamperini. The, the second one, not the one that Angelina Jolie directed, but the second one that was a Christian, that actually Billy Graham's grandson played Billy. Do you remember going to see this or have you already? Okay, yeah. Um, I was trying to think if I went with, uh, if we went or if it was uh, Kate and I on a, anyway, Hacksaw Ridge. Um, he's a, um, is he a Seventh Day Adventist? Yeah. Um, and he, um, he refuses to, he refuses to not serve, but he can't, he, he's got conviction that he can't, uh, he can't kill while he's out there. What's that? Because he left his father in World War I. Oh, okay. The, the guy in the movie, his dad was... The main character. Okay. So, so what does he do? He's a, yeah, he's a medic. Yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's a medic, and he is saves, you know, saves a, a bunch of lives while he's out there. I respect that, um, but I'm not a, um, I'm not a civil pacifist. Uh, I don't think that's necessary from the scriptures, but, but I also respect those who are, and um, I just would say, I think it's as simple as that. Peter. Yeah, getting sort of back to Yeah, because he, he's treated as divinity, yeah. Because the
have the privilege of rewriting history. Oh, sure, in sure. Their favor. Mm -hmm. so that's what Pharaoh wanted, but that did not happen. Mm -hmm. And so that episode is more like not even written down. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Blessing. Yeah, so. Um, God's bringing just an absolute judgment. And, um, you know, I, I think that this kind of brings together a lot of what we've said, and it kind of takes it back to what uh, you were um, uh, concluding earlier, Jeff. Uh, if we believe that God is the God who will judge, vengeance is mine, I will repay, that should really give us um, a strong sense of patience even with injustices that are occurring on the earth, even ones that happen to us. Um, you know, that's, that's why in, in Hebrews in the New Testament, um, you know, the writer talks about how you, you had your, you were willing to have your property plundered because you knew that you, had an, you have an abiding inheritance. Um, it's in Hebrews 10, I believe. Um, it's why Paul was willing to be beaten almost to death. And... Um, and he gets right back up and he goes back into the town and continues to preach. That's not because he's defiant, although, you know, in his flesh he probably would say that he had that tendency. Um, but it's because he really does, uh, he really does have a love for his kinsmen for whom he weeps. Romans 9, he weeps that they'd be saved, the very ones who beat him. Because he knows that God's going to judge. It's not my job to judge. It's my job to present the, uh, the message of grace and to invite them uh, to Christ. And uh, he says, that was me before. You know, uh, the, the, the love of God and the patience of Jesus overflowed for me um, so that I would be an example of the patience of Christ. Um, again, that's, he says that's the purpose of my conversion is so that Jesus would show his patience towards people. Uh, and yet... What does he say in Athens? He says, um, God has fixed a day, and he's going to judge the world, and he's proved it by raising, raising that, the man who's the standard, Jesus, from the dead. Um, so it's, he is a just God, and justice is going to come in the end, and we should... I'll just, let me say this before we, before we continue on. This is from Psalm, I want to say it's Psalm 67... Not a hundred, but close. No, it's 67, yeah. Psalm 67. <clears throat> the reason why the nations should be glad. Psalm 67, verse 4. So, uh, whereas uh, this, is, this is calling, seems like Israel to praise him. May God be gracious to us and bless us. Make his face shine on us, that he may be known on the earth. Your saving power among the nations. Let the peoples praise you. The peoples praise you. It begins to kind of fan out to everybody else. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Now, um, there are two really counterintuitive ideas here that are... Um, given as reasons why we should be glad. One is that he judges the peoples with justice and with equity, with fairness. He's a fair judge. Um, why should that make us glad? Because there are so few fair judges. <laughs> There's such injustice in the world. Um, and if, if left to ourselves, that might be the end of the story, but it's not. God is a just judge. If there are unfair judges, it must be because those people are under some degree of judgment. And if not, or even if so, that unjust judge is going to be judged later. And God, is, he just always keeps things in balance, judges of equity. And secondly, related to that, let the nations be glad and sing for joy because you guide the nations upon the earth. Um, this says that world history belongs to him. It isn't as though you have God working, you have God's hands off of his world, and only if people call upon him can he 
let one of his fingers get involved and, and work in their lives. And, but everything else is just kind of, you know, in a nominalistic, philosophically nominalistic way, just working on its own. And he guides the nations upon the earth. That's counterintuitive to say that when we talk about his sovereignty, what we mean is not just that he's sovereign in us and in our lives. We believe that he's, he's in control. He knows what he's doing. And there's no, um, there's no need to reconcile that with the injustice of the world uh, and the injustice of the, uh, the rulers of the earth and how people are because that was one of my main points in the Genesis series was to get you to see that it's through the wickedness of fallen humanity that God works his will. And thanks be to God. Otherwise, otherwise we would have no, no gospel grace, hope. Uh, but we do, because he works in the midst of it, and he judges the peoples with equity. So it, it's supposed to make us glad, and one day heaven's going to be full. Back to your point, Jeff, um, uh, seen in Revelation. Heaven's going to be full of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation rejoicing that he has judged his enemies who were even from their nations. This is why this whole like intersectionality and um, this um, critical race theory stuff is just so absurd to me, where we identify ourselves by the people group that we came from. If you're a Christian, that's not your people group. Your people group is the people of God. Um, they're, they're the ones who you're going to spend eternity with. And guess what? There are people from every tribe, tongue, and nation who are a part of that group. And um, God is going to judge. Uh, let me say this. God does judge everybody. It's just that Christians are those who had their judgment for their sins uh, placed on Christ. Everybody else is going to bear it on their own. And that's fair. Go ahead, Paul. No, it's after 1030, but go ahead, please. Well, the, the, the all of Sunday school has been easy so far. You're going to make it difficult now. Okay. Yeah. It fits right in. Whatever you're going to say. It's honorable and so
So, so we have to, to your point, Paul, and I'm really glad you read that because I think that distills really we well. Ended up, we ended up talking about do not, uh, if vengeance is mine, which is Jesus quote, I will repay, says the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So right on. It, it, it is, it is. And um, we'll, we have to uh, learn to see that there's not a, that there's not any kind of antinomy or um, contradiction or paradox even between blessing uh, our enemies and those who might persecute those who were unjust and looking forward to the day when that is judged uh, in the end. So that's to your point, Paul. Um, how we pray, we pray for those in the world to have repentance and salvation, we should pray for that first, right? That should be our first prayer. Um, and our second prayer should be, if that is not going to happen, judge. But notice we're not starting with judging. We're, we, want, we want to bless first. Um, at the same time, for abortion to be destroyed in this country, it's going to require a lot of people probably losing their jobs and certifications and being prosecuted. Um, but that's what justice requires. So I want to see repentance first, but if not, I'm gonna, I want to see judgment because that's what God wants to see. And so, when we get to heaven, what are we going to see? We're going to see praise um, to the God of salvation. He has made us a kingdom of priests, all of that. Genesis, or Revelation, oh my goodness, I'm trying to close here and I can't hold it all in my mind at once. Revelation 5, and prayer to the God of justice, as we saw earlier in uh, Revelation 15, uh, 16, 17, etc. So it's not to your point, it's not a both and, it's not an either or, it's a both. We want to we pray for repentance first and bless. Um, we also know that God is a, ju a just God and a fair God, and we pray for both, and in heaven we're going to rejoice and praise him for both as well. So um, let's, uh, let's pray. We're, we're, we've gone late here, and uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray. So Father, indeed, uh, we look at this story of the deliverance of the people of God from Egypt, and uh, we see how it, it was the result of your judgment of Egypt and Pharaoh and the sin there, seen in the plagues, seen in the, uh, the Red Sea um, drowning, and it's really just a, a horrendous uh, thing to imagine undergoing. And yet it lived on in the people of Israel's songbook and, and the Psalms. For your steadfast love endures forever. You destroyed Pharaoh and his host. Love for who? Well, love for your name and love for your people who follow you. And so I pray, O oh Lord, that people would draw them to yourself. Give repentance there. And in the end, O oh Lord, judge and have your perfect justice because you are good. We know that in heaven we're going to glory in Christ, the Lamb who was slain and who rose from the dead. And we also know that we're going to rejoice that God's justice and fairness has won. And so I pray, O oh Lord, that you would keep us on the narrow path, the way that's hard, but it's the way that leads to life. Teach us, O oh Lord, to be Christ-like, for that's why we live and to use our time and worship in the coming minutes to that end. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.